Hello everyone, my name is Scott Rabidou, and today we're going to be learning about an important Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm called coupling from the past. Suppose that we want to sample from a given probability distribution pi on a finite state space S, where pi sub i is the probability of sampling state i. Let us assume that we have already constructed a valid update function phi that will advance our Markov chain from one time step to the next. And let us assume that we have chosen phi in such a way that the distribution of the chain at time n converges to our desired distribution pi as n goes to infinity. Now a typical MCMC algorithm goes as follows. First, let n equal zero and select an initial state as a starting point for our chain. Next, we want to generate a random number u sub n from a uniform 0, 1 distribution. We then plug the initial state and u sub n into our update function phi to get the next state of the chain. This process is then repeated over and over until n is large enough that the distribution of the chain is believed to be approximately pi. At this point, the last state of the chain is outputted as our sample. Unfortunately, there are two significant problems with this common MCMC -MC algorithm. First, while we know that the distribution of the Markov chain, mu sub n, converges to our desired distribution pi as the chain runs infinitely long, the two are often never exactly the same. This means that we aren't actually sampling from the exact distribution that we want. A second problem is that it's usually quite difficult to find an upper bound for the length of the chain, such that once the bound is reached, the error in the chain's distribution is less than a given epsilon. If a bound is found, it is most likely extremely large and thus unhelpful to us computationally. Note that alone, the first problem is merely an annoyance, but coupled with the second problem, it becomes a much more serious issue. Two mathematicians, James Propp and David Wilson, shown here, understood these limitations and searched for a solution. In 1996, they developed an algorithm which they called coupling from the past that attempts to solve the two issues seen on the previous slide. The main idea of the algorithm involves running multiple instances of the same Markov chain, each with different starting values, and seeing where the chains couple or coalesce. What's interesting about this algorithm is that the chains are not running from time zero onward, but rather running from some finite time in the past up to time zero, hence the term coupling from the past. Here you can see my attempt at illustrating chains coupling. Note that when two chains couple, their colors mix as well. The coupling from the past algorithm is as follows. Let n1, n2, and so on be an increasing set of integer values. You'll have to just take my word for it that 1, 2, 4, 8, or the powers of 2, tend to be a popular choice. The negatives of these n values will be used as starting times for our chains. Next, let u0, u-1, and so on be identically independently distributed random numbers from a uniform 0, 1 distribution. We start by setting m equal to 1, and for each possible state s, simulate a Markov chain with initial state s, starting at time negative n sub m, and stopping at time 0. An important thing to note is that we reuse the same random 0, 1 value to update each of the chains. Once all the chains have reached time 0, we check and see if they're all in the same state. If they are, then we output that shared state as our sample. Otherwise, we increase m by 1 and run the chains again, this time starting from further in the past. Another important thing to note is that each time we start our chains from a time further in the past, we have to reuse uniform 0, 1 numbers from time steps that we've already ran through. For example, 
if we just finished running our chains from time negative 4 to 0, and now we have to start again from time negative 8, once we hit time negative 4, we will reuse the uniform 0, 1 numbers from the previous iteration. Let's have a look at a small example to better understand how this algorithm works. Say we have a state space S with three possible states, and our starting times n are 1, 2, 4, 8, etc. We start with our chains at time negative 1 and compute our first random number between 0 and 1, plugging it into our update function for each of the three states. Assume we get the following output from our update function. So, starting at state 1, we move to state 1. Starting at state 2, we move to state 2. And starting from state 3, we move to state 1. So our chains look like this. We note that all three chains did not converge by time 0, so we have to start again from time negative 2 and repeat the process, reusing the same uniform 0, 1 numbers from the previous iteration. So let's say we run our phi again, and now our chains look like this. Note that the dotted lines are paths that a chain would take if it had been in that state, but since none of our chains actually follow that path, it's unused. Again, we see that our chains have not converged by time zero, so we now start again from time negative four, again reusing uniform zero one samples. This time, as you can see, all three chains have now converged to a single state by time zero, state two. Thus, we output state two as our sample. So, how does this algorithm solve the two problems that we saw earlier? Well, since every chain has the same value at time zero, starting at some time in the past, we could think of running these chains from even further in the past and still getting the same result. So, imagine that you start a chain from time negative infinity and run up until time zero. By the time we hit zero, the chain would be infinitely long, thus in equilibrium, and perfectly representing our desired distribution. And this chain would still give us the same output that we computed from some finite time in the past. To help see this, note that any chain we run from negative infinity has to match up with a chain from our coupling from the past algorithm, since we ran chains starting from every possible state. So, problem one is taken care of. Problem two, in which we are unsure as to how long our chain needs to run, is eliminated by the fact that the coupling from the past algorithm will stop on its own when it has a sample, like when the chains coalesce. Now, it is not guaranteed that the algorithm will find a sample in finite time. Sometimes the chains never converge. However, it is possible in most situations to prove that the algorithm will in fact terminate with probability 1. Now there exists a proof that this algorithm does what I claim it does, but it would take too long to walk through right now, so we're going to move on to a more interesting example. The example I want to show you all is called the icy model. Let's say that we have a graph G with vertices V and edges E. The IC model is a way to randomly generate graphs of this type with values of either negative 1 or 1 at each of the vertices. The physical interpretation of this graph is that each vertex can be viewed as an atom in a ferromagnetic material with the negative and positive ones representing two possible spin configurations for each atom. There are two physical entities that determine the probability of a certain configuration. The inverse temperature, beta, and the energy of the system, which is given by the function h of c. Now, h takes the values of two vertices connected by an edge, multiplies their spin values, takes the negative, and sums up these values for each edge in the system. So, if the endpoints of a given edge have opposite signs, 
then one energy is added to the total. And if the endpoints are of the same sign, then one energy is subtracted from the total. The probability of being in a certain configuration is then proportional to a function of beta and h. Specifically, it is proportional to e to the negative beta times the energy of the configuration. See some students might recognize this formula from our statistical mechanics class. Now, how do we implement a coupling from the past algorithm for the icing model? First, we have to devise a Markov chain that will sample graphs of this type. The value of our Markov chain, m, at each time step will be some configuration of negative ones and ones for our graph. Given a current state, m sub t, of a Markov chain, we advance to the next state by picking a vertex x at random and then choosing whether or not to change its current value. We do this by generating a uniform 0, 1 sample, u sub t, and using the following update function. If our random number is less than some function of x seen here, then the value of x is set to positive 1. Otherwise, the value is set to negative 1. This change of a single vertex, or non-change, creates the configuration for the next step in our Markov chain. Note that our function of x depends on functions k plus and k minus, which output the number of vertices connected to x with the value positive 1 and negative 1, respectively. Now, you'll just have to trust me on this, that the chain indeed samples configurations based on the probability function that we saw earlier. Based on this Markov chain, we can construct a coupling from the past algorithm. We'll need to run two to the k Markov chains, k being the number of vertices in the graph, since we need a Markov chain for each possible state, and each vertex in the graph can take on two possible values, negative one or one. When updating each chain, we'll use the same random vertex, as well as the same random uniform zero one number to plug into the update function. Now, for a graph with some small number of vertices, like this one here, this method works just fine. Running two to the six chains is not too much trouble. But for Markov chains to really be useful, we need to have a very large state space. For a graph with many vertices, like this square lattice, running two to the k Markov chains can be extremely computationally intensive. Wouldn't it be nice to need to only run a fraction of these chains and still get the same results? Maybe even just two of them? Well, this can be done by taking advantage of an idea called sandwiching. As the name and picture imply, sandwiching requires two chains to act as boundaries, bounding all other chains between them. If this is the case, then when the two boundary chains converge, all other chains will have converged as well. Now, sandwiching requires some sort of ordering of the state space so that one state can be viewed as greater than another. It also requires that a chain occupying a greater state will never fall below a chain in a lesser state. So assuming state one is less than state two, this requirement is illustrated by the three scenarios here. If we can satisfy both of these conditions, we can essentially run two chains, one starting at the maximum state and one starting at the minimum state, and get the same result as if we had run all two to the k chains. You can think of all possible chains being sandwiched in between the maximum and the minimum chains. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Scott, these seem like very specific conditions. There's no way that sandwiching can be used for every problem, and you would be right. There are many cases in which sandwiching cannot be used. However, there are also many cases in which it can be used, and it just so happens that the icing model is a perfect example of a real-world problem that can take advantage of sandwiching. So, let's see how this works specifically for the icing model. For the icing model, 
we can think of the minimum state as the configuration in which all vertices have the value negative 1, and the maximum state as the configuration in which all vertices have the value positive 1. The ordering of the states can be viewed as follows. A certain state A is less than or equal to a different state B if for each vertex x, A of x is less than or equal to B of x. You can see that with this ordering scheme, the minimum configuration is in fact less than or equal to all other configurations. And similarly, the maximum configuration is greater than or equal to all other configurations. Note that this is not a total ordering, since there are many pairs of configurations that have neither ordering relationship. Let's see why this ordering scheme works for sandwiching. Recall our update function for a vertex B shown here. There exists a theorem that says any two states, A and B, such that A is less than or equal to B at time t, will maintain their ordering relationship at time t plus 1, assuming we use the update function above. To see this, Remember that when updating each state, we use the same random vertex to modify. So, if A is less than B at time t, then there are two possible outcomes to consider for time t plus 1. If the chosen vertex at state A takes on the value negative 1, then no matter the value of the vertex in state B, A will still be less than or equal to B. But if the chosen vertex in state A takes on the value positive 1, it can be shown that it must also take on the value positive 1 in state B. This requires some analysis of our update probability, shown here. You can think about it on your own, but for now we'll just take this as fact. We know that the minimum configuration is less than all other states, since all of its vertices have the value negative 1. So, this theorem implies that any chain starting at the minimum configuration will bound from below all other chains for all time. A similar argument can be made to show that a chain in the maximum configuration will bound all other chains from above. Thus, in order to sample graphs from the icing model using coupling from the past, we only need to run two chains no matter how large the state space is which is a pretty incredible conclusion. We've learned a lot of information today, so let's review some key points. Coupling from the past is a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that allows for perfect sampling from a desired distribution. With coupling from the past, there is no concern over when the algorithm should stop, since it does so automatically whenever the chains converge. Sandwiching, which requires some extra conditions, allows us to drastically reduce our problem's state space, which can make impossibly large problems much easier to deal with computationally.